today at Zion Lutheran Church in Chelsea, Michigan. It's November 14th, 2021, and we're glad that you've joined us for worship today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Now, this week we celebrated Veterans Day, honoring those men and women who've worn the uniform in the armed services of our country and thanking them for both their service and their sacrifice, the portions of their life and, and their health that they have given up and sacrificed in defense of our country and our freedoms. They are a gift from God, and they are part of uh, working God's kingdom out on the earth. So I, I'm sure that there are many times they wondered uh, what was coming next as they uh, carried out their service. And we probably have wondered what's coming next too. I remember watching cartoons when I was a kid and someone was carrying a sign saying, the end is near, the end is near. And that's what we'll be talking about today with some of our Bible passages. The end times, is the end near? The disciples asked Jesus, it looks like things are kind of coming to a climax. Can you tell us what's going on? And, and what will be the signs we should look for to say that the end is near? And so the question we'll talk about today is, are the end times coming, or perhaps are they already here? All right, 
Let's begin with prayer. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let's read from Scripture today. The first reading comes from the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, of verses 11 to 14, and then 19 through 25. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, Christ has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, he opened for, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and to good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading today is from the gospel of Mark, the 13th chapter, beginning with the first verse. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us. When will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The lessons appointed for today focus on endings and beginnings, but especially endings. The disciples grew up as good Jewish boys. They learned what God had promised for God's chosen people. But what was coming next? How would they know? And how often do we, in 21st century America, ask very similar questions? Let's begin with our reading from Hebrews. Now, this letter is different from some others in the New Testament. Many are defined by the author. We know that Luke wrote Acts. We know that Paul wrote Romans and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Many of them are defined by the author, but this one is defined by the audience. We don't actually know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but the audience was believers who grew up Jewish and who followed Jewish religious practices. Jewish religious practices mattered, and biblical prophecies mattered to this particular group of people. And so the letter was aimed at them. The 
Jewish practices of sacrifices, of rules, of priests who offered sacrifices on behalf of the people, well, that's foreign to us in, in the United States, in Michigan, but it would have been familiar to the audience of this letter. It goes right to the heart of their relationship with God, how they connected with God, both in the past and in the present. Now, as part of their rituals, the priest would stand at the altar. They would perform the necessary tasks, the rituals. They would say the words following the tradition that had been set down back in the early days from Aaron and the Levites and the, the descendants of Aaron and those initial 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, part of the tradition was having the priest standing behind a curtain, not seen by the people because that well, that was the holy place. That's where God was. And the people who were not holy enough to go in there would stay on this side of the curtain. That curtain in the temple is the same one when we read the story about Jesus being crucified, that that temple was, curtain was torn from top to bottom, opening up the path. So the writer of Hebrews paints a picture that these believers would understand and then extends that picture uses the old ideas as a base for understanding Jesus and our salvation through him. The priest had to offer multiple sacrifices, yet Jesus offered one sacrifice. The priest would stand at the altar while offering these, and after offering that one sacrifice that was enough to save us from our sins, Jesus could sit down. The writer then extends it to the people. What does it mean to them? We have confidence to enter the sanctuary, not just the priest entering the sanctuary, but we have confidence to enter the sanctuary. And the living way that Jesus has opened for us through the curtain. Martin Luther picked up on this idea of all of us going into the sanctuary, all of us going through the curtain, when he talked about the priesthood of all believers. That's something I preached about a couple of weeks ago on Reformation Sunday. The priesthood of all believers means we can all go in past the curtain to the altar and experience God. And most importantly, the writer encourages us to hope without wavering. Well, how should we respond to this good news, to this way through the curtain? We are to encourage one another and there's another translation of that last verse that I like, to stir one another up to love and good works. Our response to this good news is centered in our hearts and in our minds, and it's made visible in our works. Now, our religious community here at Zion, we are not focused on sacrifice or rituals that put us right with God, although there are some times we can feel like we're separated. We're standing behind a curtain. We need to wear face coverings when we come to in-person worship here. I needed to go get a COVID test after people who had attended our in-person worship, ser in worship service tested positive. And fortunately, my test was negative. Our response needs to be like that of the Hebrews, to encourage one another to stir one another up, to stir up people to love and good works. Like the plague in the 1500s back in Luther's day, like the flu pandemic in 1918 through 1920, we experience many scary things. We experience fires, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, and now we even have a plague. We're tempted to pull Jesus aside privately and ask him, what's going on? Are these the signs of the end times? What do these signs mean? Our gospel reading today also has Jewish people who grew up learning Jewish stories and asking Jewish questions. The story is set after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it's, the first part is in the temple with the disciples, and the second part is on a hill opposite the, uh, the temple, looking down at the temple. Now, the disciples, Jesus' good Jewish boys, took very seriously the prophecies they had heard about the Messiah. And so let me give you just a glimpse into the environment they grew up in 
and how they would have heard those prophecies. Alexander the Great, the, the Greek, had conquered this entire part of the world through uh, present-day Turkey, present-day Palestine, back in about 300 BC. But yet, the local Judean leaders had broken away from Greek rule from about 140 BC to about 70 BC. They actually had a Jewish Hasmonean king on the throne calling the shots. So as I do the math, Mary and Joseph, Jesus' parents, would have sat at their grandparents' knee and heard stories about the good old days, back uh, when there was a Jewish Hasmonean king on the throne calling the shots. They, that was a very real part of their experience, of their memory. This Roman occupation came later, but that memory of when Jews were in charge of their own destiny, that was an important part of the prophecies. So the idea of a revolution, of a warrior king like David, was very real to the disciples. That would have been consistent with the stories they heard from the rabbis and from their own grandparents. There was tension in Jerusalem. The Pharisees and the religious leaders were challenging Jesus at every turn. And so they pulled Jesus aside privately. Peter and Andrew, James and John, and said, what are the signs? How will we know when the end is coming, when this revolution is coming? And Jesus indeed gives them an answer that starts out talking about violence and destruction. Now it's worth noting that back in 66 AD, 66 years after Jesus was born, there was a Jewish revolution and, there was, and the Roman soldiers responded with great violence and indeed the temple was destroyed and the stones were thrown down, not one stone left on another. So we don't know exactly when the Gospel of Mark was written down, the sayings of Jesus were circulating orally for a while. So was the Gospel writer of Mark saying, putting, believing that Jesus was prophesying, was predicting what would happen? Or if it was written, perhaps the Gospel writer was talking about the experience that they had lived through and they had watched the temple be destroyed. We don't really know exactly. But I want you to focus on what Jesus does say. Don't get caught up in the speculation about when it was written. They ask the question, what will happen? How will we know? And Jesus answered by talking about earthquakes, wars, and rumors of wars, and said that these were just the beginning of the birth pangs. Well, that's not such a familiar phrase. Let's put it in a more familiar phrase. These are the contractions are still about 20 minutes apart, and uh, the dilation is only about one centimeter. This is just the beginning of the birth process. Jesus didn't point to one singular event that says, when this happens, you'll know the end is coming. In fact, Jesus didn't point to a series of key events. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, beware that no one leads you astray. Guard your hearts, guard your mind, guard your ears. If you're looking for events, if you're looking for signs, you've missed the point. If we look back over the years since 9-11, many of us are wondering, are we living in the end times? We've got wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, fire, and a plague. Are we living in the end times? It was not very long ago. It was during my lifetime. We feared that the Soviet Union, the USSR, would fire nuclear ICBMs and destroy major American cities, ending our way of life. We thought we were living in the end times. During my parents' lifetime, they saw World War II, a, world, a war that killed hundreds of thousands of people on every continent. There was the Great Depression that destroyed many jobs and livelihoods. I imagine they wondered if they were living in the end times. Back at the start of the 20th century, we had World War I, the war to end all wars. It had poison gas, and it was followed by a flu pandemic that swept across the world, killing millions of people. They must have thought they 
We're living in the end times. Go back just a little further in the middle of the 1800s. Napoleon led an army and conquered Europe and the United States was split by a violent civil war. The roots of that war were, were, was whether or not a person, a white person like me, could own another person or own a family, chattel slavery. I have to believe as war swept across multiple countries, they had to wonder, were they living in the end times? You can think of more examples, but I believe in each period, if we read this past Gospel of Mark, Jesus' answer to believers in those times is just the same. Beware that no one leads you astray. Guard your hearts, guard your mind, guard your ears. If you're looking for specific events, you've missed the point. Today, we at Zion are asking similar questions. Are we living in the end times? The COVID pandemic has changed our lives. It's changed our communities, our society in fundamental ways, and some things will never change back. An example, when my kids were little, in the 1990s, we took my wife to the airport to put her on a plane and go visit family. And we walked all the way from the ticket counter to the gate, we watched her go through the doors, get on the plane, we watched the plane taxi and take off and wave goodbye. That'll never happen again. After the events of 9-11, security in airports has changed fundamentally and permanently. Look at what the pandemic has done to us, our practices of how we work from our homes, how we work remotely, how we gather remotely. Those changes are probably permanent. The question I think Zion needs to ask, and I think we're working towards the answer, is what is God calling us to be? If we're not expecting these stones, the stones of this building, to be thrown down, but if we are living in a world, a community that has changed, how is God calling us to respond? Remember back when we started the lead process in 2019. It began with listening. Where is our neighborhood? What needs are present in our neighborhood and how should our church, our congregation, our community of faith respond to those needs? What is God calling us to do? We began by listening. And this listening is a key part of our call process now in 2021. We've written our ministry site profile. Many of you responded to the email from the call committee. What is God calling us to do? How does our faith community want to work God's purpose out post-pandemic with the changes in society. Now your humble servant, God's servant, doesn't have an answer to those questions, at least not yet. I think part of the path forward will be a combination, a combination of using this building where we have fed people and continue to feed people, hosting community meals, a combination of using this building, but also meeting people where they are, out there, in, in a park, the new Culver's that's under construction at, at CRC or Silver Maples, or the St. Louis Center where homeless folks are seeking shelter. We meet people where they are in online meetings, those that we host and those that we join that other people host. Uh, you might be saying, well, we have a new pastor coming, but the new pastor will not be the answer to this question. God will lay and has laid this question on all of our hearts. I encourage you to pray, to meet together, to listen for what God is laying on our hearts. The writer of Hebrews urged us to focus on Jesus, to enter the temple with confidence, with clean hearts, clean minds, and to hope without wavering. Jesus, in our gospel reading, asks us to stop looking for specific events. Stop looking for the end times. Focus on Jesus' message and beware not to be led astray. We respond by encouraging, by stirring each other up to good works and to love, even in the face of tremendous change. Even after our lives, after my life, has been changed in ways that I don't want, changed in ways that I don't like. 
even after the stones have been thrown down. Yes, church, we are living in the end times. And yes, God will still love us through it, as God does, because he who has promised is faithful. Amen. Eternal God, you hold firm amid the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and everyone in need. I'll end each petition with God in your mercy, and I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. God, our constant, you love our universe from beginning to end. As the seasons change, protect animals that migrate and hibernate. Bring them safely to a sheltered place and a more abundant season. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our stronghold, you are present amid disaster. We pray for those affected by natural disasters. Come to the aid of all survivors of earthquakes, famines, floods, hurricanes, and wildfires, and the first responders who support them. Calm their fear. Supply their need, and be the solid ground beneath their feet. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our helper and protector, we lift up all who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit. Bless those on our prayer list. Bless those who are hospitalized or recovering, including my father. Let sustain those who are acting as caregivers, including my mother. Those we name now on our hearts, either aloud or silently. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our hope and strength we entrust to you, all for whom we pray. Remain with us always, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship today. We have a few announcements for things coming up here at Zion and Chelsea. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone about our candy roll project. Now this is a, a Christmas project that makes uh, rolls uh, for folks in homeless shelters. Uh, there's candy inside, but it's rolled up in blankets and other things that they need. We'll be collecting supplies to make the candy rolls through November 21st. We'll ask you to uh, assemble them at home and then we'll collect and get them to the shelters by Christmas. Uh, we have a community game night on Saturday, December 4th, where we'll gather and play card games, board games, all kinds of fun for those who wanna gather in person. Saturday, December 4th at 7 p.m. And finally, our children's Christmas program. It'll be in person this year. Last year, we did a wonderful program where each uh, kid uh, recorded their own parts separately in their homes, and we were able to stitch it together with some, uh, with some video technology. But, but this year, we're going to, to gather in person. The rehearsals are beginning in November. Uh, dress rehearsal will be Saturday, December 18th, and we'll present it during worship on Sunday, December 19th. Those are the announcements we have for today. Please receive this blessing as you go out into your week. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As passionate, devoted followers of Jesus Christ, go out into the world and declare all that God has done for you. Thanks be to God. Have a great week, everyone.